Can we pray as we start? Heavenly Father, thank you that you are love and that all love comes from you. And so as we come to consider your love tonight, we're considering you and we're considering your character and the nature of who you are. And so, Lord, we pray that you would take us deeper in our understanding of love and of you tonight by your spirit, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for the invite. It's been a little while since I've been here, but it's really great to be back. Um, so thank you very much for the invite to come and speak to you tonight. Um, and I must admit, um, I've got a, um, I've, I feel like I need to confess this right at the outset, but um, I've got a slight vested interest in looking at this passage because I'm getting married in just under a month's time. We're not actually having that reading, um, but um, uh, I've, I've really enjoyed looking at this passage and we had it as part of the lectionary for church this morning. And it just felt like such a rich passage that it was too good to pass up for speaking on it uh, tonight. So um, what is love and how do we define love? Well we've got Valentine's Day coming up haven't we? So is love all about chocolates and roses? Um, I think I also need to say that with the caveat that we live in Yorkshire and um, so I've already had the <laughs> the precursor that's just a tradition <laughs> um, we probably aren't going to be celebrating uh, Valentine's Day Rob and I bearing, up, bearing in mind the expense of the wedding coming up um, but is love about romance or feelings? Um, is love about um, Hollywood and the Hollywood image of love, um, where a girl meets a boy, they fall in love, probably some kind of disaster happens, and then all comes to good at the end, and there's always a good ending. Or is love about um, the thing that you see that is reflected in other people? Um, so um, that thing that bubbles up when children laugh, or the kind of ready brick glow feeling that you have when you're in the company of really life-giving people? Um, or is it something about the laughter lines um, of parents or grandparents, um, the wrinkles that come from um, years steeped in the presence of other people that they've cared for? Well, um, I also Googled um, love earlier on. Um, so I looked on Amazon and there are three million entries if you, t if you put the title love into Amazon as a search. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it because there were some quite fruity things that came up. <laughs> but um, And randomly, there was um, a pack of ink cartridges that came up on the first page as well. So I'm not sure that I would recommend that as a, a finding your definition for, um, for love. Um, but obviously, we've got the biblical definition, which is what we've looked at tonight. Um, and actually, I think we can view the whole of the Bible as a definition of love, because it's, it's one of the best love stories in the world, isn't it? That we start off with perfection in the Garden of Eden, and then um, there is a disaster that happens, um, and there's a breaking of the covenant between people and God. And then the rest of the Bible really is one long romance of the way that God chases his people, woos his people, romances his people, doesn't give up on his people, unfailingly chases after them and, and wants to take them back. That's real love, isn't it? That, that's, that is an, an image of love, of really, really deep, faithful, committed, covenanted love. Um, and then, obviously, if we look at uh, the story of Jesus and Jesus' sacrifice, that's another amazing story of love to have given up the riches of heaven, to come to earth, to draw us into the heart of the Father, to draw us into the Father's love. That's an amazingly rich picture of love. But we're looking specifically at 1 Corinthians 13 um, tonight. So I'm going to go back to the, uh, the reading. And actually, it's really good that we've had the, um, the message version of 1 Corinthians. The version that I've put up is the NRSV. So we're going to look at it in another version as well. But these words probably will be really familiar to you. You've probably heard them lots at um, weddings that you've been to or read them many times over. Um, and I've taken the... Um, scripture slightly in a different order because I'm going to speak about 1 Corinthians 13 in three parts so I've taken the middle part first so love is patient love is kind it does not envy it does not boast it's not proud or rude it's not self-seeking it's not easily angered it keeps no record of wrongs love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth 
always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Now you may be familiar with um, uh, this technique of using the scripture where I've put the words in yellow. Um, there is a, um, a thing that you can do, you can apply the scripture to yourself where the word love is or it is. Um, how about substituting your name into the scripture? So um, I know I've, I find that very, very challenging. Um, it's a bit like a barometer of how we're doing. Can I say that Mary is not proud, um, that I'm not easily angered, that I don't delight in evil? Well, I can't wholeheartedly say that, that I do all of those things all of the time at all. Um, it's really, really challenging when we apply the scripture to our lives like that. And it can be a bit of a measure of how we're doing, how, how loving we are. Um, how we're managing to live out God's love, live out the thing that we receive so freely and how we're living it out with other people. Um, this is where I think that the Bible probably needs a bit of a health warning, doesn't it? When we come to scripture, um, we can't come to scripture without anticipating that it might change us or it might challenge us um, or it might speak something to us that we need to address. That's the way that God's word is living and active isn't it when um, we we look at it through a lens of how we're doing in responding to Jesus in responding to God's love so can I challenge you if you've not done this before um, maybe to make a cup of tea at some point during the week with your bible and with 1 Corinthians 13 and to have a look at this chapter have a look at specifically this bit and and just read it with that lens or you might want to read it through the lens of putting Jesus's name into that that's also a really really that's a really edifying thing to do because that is brings out all of the facets of God's character all of the facets of who Jesus is when you put Jesus's name into there as the highest of bars to be looking at Jesus does not delight in e evil but rejoices with the truth Jesus always protects always trusts always hopes always perseveres that's a, that's a really edifying thing to do. And it's another good way of looking at Jesus and looking at who he is. So if I can have the next slide. We're going to track back to the top of the chapter. Um, and um, this is about how love is central to everything that we do. If God is love, then does a lack of love indicate where God is absent? And when we look at this section of scripture, we can read that. This is a little bit like a Christian CV, like a spiritual CV. Um, who are the super Christians that can speak in tongues of men or angels, that have gifts of prophecy or can discern with lots of knowledge or can give all that they possess to the poor give their body over to hardship, that could read as a spiritual CV. And yet, if there's not love in the mix, then it's all completely meaningless. If we speak in tongues of angels or of men without love, it's all just noise, isn't it? There's not anything, there's no substance to it, there's no backbone to it. We could be super spiritual with words of prophecy and knowledge, and yet if there's not any love there, then actually what um, Paul says earlier on in chapter 12, he talks about the essence of prophecy being about encouragement and building up. So if there's no love there, where is the building up? Where is the encouragement that comes with prophecy? So it becomes meaningless if there's no love there. And verse 3 is... Um, Paul is taking the literal extreme of Jesus' teaching about giving everything to the poor. But without love, it's just works or deeds. And as I was, as I was driving here, actually, I had a, a little reflection, which I'm going to share with you because it's, it's slightly, I, I feel like I need to give a bit of a caveat that it's a slightly unformed thought because it came in the car as I was driving here. But I was just thinking about how if we do all of the things that Jesus commanded, but we do them without love, is that without grace? And does when we do the things that Jesus said with love, is that where they become more gracious? 
that without, if we give everything to the poor, um, if we are following Jesus but without love, they're not particularly gracious acts because they're just works or deeds. So I'll leave that with you because I, I, <laughs> I feel like I've not fully worked that out yet as well, but it occurred to me so I'm sharing it with you. But I think that you can see in this passage as well how Paul is really lining up his letter to the Corinthians. So chapter 12 has talked about spiritual gifts. So all the stuff about tongues, prophecy, words of knowledge, faith. This in, in this chapter, in chapter 13, this is coming after Paul has already introduced this. And then when you go into chapter 14, there's more stuff on the spiritual gifts and there's more stuff on the body of Christ and what it means to be in community. And Paul is teaching all of those things to the Corinthians because they're going a little bit astray with the way that they're using the spiritual gifts. So chapter 13 is bookended by um, the spiritual gifts um, and the body of Christ and what it means to be in community. And it's probably no accident that right in the middle of that, Paul's put this amazing teaching on love, that love needs to be right in the middle of all of that. It needs to be central to um, everything that we do, that none of these gifts or operating them in the body are particularly meaningful unless love is right at the root of everything. And actually when um, Paul goes on, to talk in chapter 15 about resurrection and the resurrection with Christ. And again, none of that is meaningful um, for us without love being at the centre of it. That kind of goes into works and deeds again, that um, the resurrection of the body, that comes out of Christ's gifts of, gift of love. So love is central. And I think for me personally, um, I don't know if this resonates with you, but I know that um, if I feel like I'm running out of love, that's where I know that I'm getting into just works and deeds and just doing things by rote. Um, and so, so often if I'm feeling in that place, it's a bit of a, a signal for me that I probably need to come back to God and I need to get back into that place of rote. If I'm feeling like um, things are becoming a chore or things are becoming a little bit dry, I'm getting into the, the zone where works and deeds are predominant and that, that for me is a bit of a flag that I've probably not spent enough time with God. I need to come back to where God is. I need to be back in his presence so that love comes back into the middle of everything that, that I'm doing. So God's love is abundant. Having said all of this, I don't want to be saying this with any um, this coming across with any judgment or condemnation because it's not about um, what we're doing is it love is at the center of everything that we do God is love um, and his love is abundant and his love is available for us and he is the one that pours out his love we don't have to beg him for it he pours out his love graciously and generously and so we just need to ask him for for more love we come to him to receive more love but I don't think that it would be right to talk about love without talking a little bit about discipline too. So Hebrews 12 talks about God who disciplines those he loves. And it's probably, um, I would hazard a guess that it's most of our experience that when we become a Christian, things aren't automatically solved, that there are still tough times. And... Um, you may have heard of the prosperity gospel, um, that uh, it can be, if we're not careful, we talk about the prosperity side of um, people becoming Christians or, um, or that the gospel is all about the blessings that we'll receive and that God is a good God and he wants to pour out his blessings. Um, and that, that means that you know, we might be wealthy or um, we'll receive lots of things. Um, that's, um, it is part of the gospel, but it's only part of the gospel. And I wonder how much we talk about blessing without talking about sacrifice um, and being honest about suffering as well. Um, so as I was thinking about this, um, I uh, was at St. Michael Le Belfry in York before I went into training for ministry. Uh, and one of the vicars who was there, he's actually moved on now, but um, I remember part of his testimony of his conversion was that um, he was 
called to the front. He, he knew that he had to respond um, to the, the message that had been given. And as the vicar, um, really, really busy London church, and I think it was a lunchtime service that he was in, and as the vicar invited people to respond and come to the front, there was a, a tide of people that were going out of the church. And as he invited people up, he said, you're going to respond to this message. You're going to have to swim against the tide, but you just need to get used to that because that's what you'll be doing for the rest of your life. Um, and I really like that because it's true, isn't it? I think we need to be honest about the fact that um, following Jesus is countercultural and it is costly. Um, and to be baptized with Christ means that we enter into his righteousness, his eternal promise. We're at the right hand side of God, but we're also baptized into his suffering. We are plan A for the world. He's no longer physically present with us. He's alive and he's spiritually present with us by his Holy Spirit. But we're the ones that are physically present as Christ for the world. We're still his hands and feet to take his love. And so that means being Christ to the broken. So that's a really easy sell for people, isn't it? Hooray, I'd love to become a Christian, <laughs> to be end to enter into all of that. So what's discipline got to do with love? Well, um, clearly, we don't become Christians and everything becomes peachy and rosy. Things still happen to us. We still go through trials and temptations. Um, bad things happen to good people, and good things happen to bad people. And being Christians doesn't inoculate us from any of that stuff. But where is God in our suffering? Well, he's right in the middle with us, isn't he? He is walking beside us. We have the mountaintop experiences, but we also have the, the valley experiences, the valley of the shadow of death. And God is there in all of it. And he's transforming it. He's transforming us through those experiences. So he's going to use every life experience that we have to transform us into the likeness of Christ. And I think actually the, th the third, I can't remember the title of the third song that we, um, that we sang, but that, the words really felt like that picked up, the, the transformation and that faithful presence of God and the way that he's, he's using those situations to work in our character um, and to purify our character. Um, and God does not test us it would be completely inconsistent to think of a loving parent who deliberately puts things in a child's way or deliberately sets traps for a child to test them and to see how they would respond to certain situations. So just to be clear that God doesn't give us the situations to test us in some way, but he's with us in the situations. Like Job, he may allow things in our lives, but he's always with us in them he's always walking with us he's always faithful and he's always present with us in anything that we go through and so this is where the the scripture from Hebrews 12 I think is really um, important and it's really um, it's really critical in those times to hold on to that actually God's discipline it's a sign of his love for us and it's a sign of our identity in him that he disciplines his children so that means that anything that we're going through, if we're going through one of those transforming situations, that is a sign that we are his children and that he is with us in those situations. And the outcome is glorious because the outcome is that we share in his holiness and that we have a harvest of righteousness and peace. So um, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about how um, life circumstances can be really um, revealing, can't they? And you may have um, had experiences where either really good experiences in life um, or really, really bad experiences in life. Um, I think they really put a spotlight on where love is around you. Um, and so um, I just want to share a story that um, one of the most beautiful reactions that I've had um, to telling somebody that I've recently become engaged. Um, so I, I met Rob in May and um, we um, it's been quite a whirlwind. Um, we're getting married in a month's time. Um, and, um, and so that it's been very, very revealing for um, a few, I'm uh, 41 and I've been single for 20 years, um, never married before. Um, and so I've, I've got single friends and actually for some of them it's been, it's been 
um, quite difficult for them, I think, because they're losing a, a single friend. Um, so it, it can be unwittingly revealing about how, you know whether people can rejoice in situations or um, or mourn with you in situations. Um, but I had um, I've got a friend who. I thought I'd lost contact with uh, last year and I, I tried to get in touch with her a number of times um, through the year and just not heard anything back and then she got in touch with me just out of the blue just before Christmas and it was lovely to hear from her and then actually quite sad to hear from her because it turned out that um, she, um, she, her marriage had, um, had broken down and so she was ringing to recruit prayer for a transition that she was going through. So absolutely my pleasure and privilege to pray for her um and so we came to the end of quite quite a, a difficult situation difficult conversation um and then she says um so mary tell me something about what's going on in your life and so it was then quite awkward to say well actually i've got engaged and um, we're going to be getting married fairly soon and she was overwhelmingly rejoicing and it was, was just the most, it moved me to tears, her reaction, because it was so beautiful. Um, and to me, that said something about um, how rooted in God's love she is, that she can give God's love out in the face of her own circumstances. Um, so I just share that because it was a really beautiful situation. Um, and I think also sometimes uh, that can be true as well, can't it? When, when we go through really bad situations, um, you can really see um, people who really genuinely love you from the people that step up and stand um, beside you. So God is transforming us. Um, and sometimes um, what may feel like discipline, actually it's, it's a sign that we're God's children and that um, he's with us and he does not test us, but he's always with us. So finally, the, um, the last section of 1 Corinthians 13. This is like our bridge into the future. Um, this is our eternal promise um, that one day we will see Jesus face to face. Um, one day we're not going to have the dim view. We're not going to have the reflection that we have to interpret in a mirror. Uh, one day we will see Jesus face to face. Um, and what we go through now will fade away. Um, because when Jesus comes again, we enter into the fullness and the abundance of the promise that he has for us. Um, and something that I learned just looking through this um, was that the reflection in a mirror, where Paul refers to a mirror here, um, Corinth was a really big mirror-making place. So I didn't know that. I thought that was really interesting. But um, the, uh, So this is a cultural reference to Corinth as a, a place that um, mirrors were made. And right at the very end, the greatest of these things is love. The greatest of faith, hope, and love is love. Because when we see Jesus face to face, we're not going to need faith because he will be there. We will be able to see the marks in his hands. We'll be able to see where the spear went into his side. We're not going to have to exert faith um, in whether that did or didn't happen because we're going to have the proof right in front of us. We'll have his living presence. And we won't need to hope for that eternal promise because we'll see his resurrection body and we'll see it with our resurrection body. We'll see it with our resurrection eyes. And so... This is our promise that God is with us in everything that we go through. That from um, love needs to be central to everything that we do, but God will give us the love. God will grow us in his love. And he shows us the facets of his character. When we look at Jesus, we know what love is. We know who love is. Um, and we have this eternal promise as well that we, we're going to step into. We will see him face to face, the one who is love, the one who gave all to be on this earth, to show us the human example of who love is and what love is. We'll see him face to face in eternity. Amen. <laughs>